We're here in a hotel room in Moscow, not your home. No reporters have interviewed you in person at home. Why is that? Well, given my situation, right, I'm, I'm kind of in a, shall we say, less stable environment than, than most people are. Uh, I don't like to bring uh, people to my home uh, because I don't know who they are, who's coming with them. And we have to remember that technically, uh, my government, right or wrong, uh, considers me to be a fugitive in exile, right? There is still technically a manhunt uh, that's following me around wherever I go. Uh, so I don't really want to make life any easier uh, for people who are trying to silence me. Do you think U.S. officials know where you live, know where you are? I think they have a general idea. Uh, at this point, you know, uh, after three years, if they can't figure it out, uh, they're probably not doing their job very well. But I don't think they know specifically where I am. I'm pretty careful. Uh, do you but move I could around? be wrong. Do you move around from apartment to apartment or do no, you no, stay no, in one place? No, no, I'm not like on the Underground Railroad or anything like that. Uh, I just try to live a careful and quiet, kind of humble life. Uh, and I don't want to be uprooted by publicity and reporters outside my home. Definitely not agents outside my home. Do you live in Russian government housing? No. How do you afford your rent? Uh, I speak uh, a number of different places. I've been incredibly fortunate uh, to enjoy as much support as I have. When I came forward, uh, I expected to be entirely alone. Um, I didn't really have a plan for the day after. My only focus uh, was working with the journalists to get the truth of what was going on uh, in violation of the law back into public hands. So I've really had to sort of build the airplane as it's falling, uh, but we've reached a point where actually uh, we're flying. Can you walk around freely the streets of Moscow and not be recognized? I walked here. Are you ever recognized? I am sometimes. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, actually. Uh, if I walk out on the street, um, people have no idea who I am. If I walk into a computer store, everyone in the store will immediately recognize me. I think it's one of those things like uh, the way your brain catches on to the association. It's been more than three years since you arrived here in Moscow. If you could d use one word to describe those three years, what would it be? Surprising. Uh, I think most Americans, uh, particularly ones who, like myself, worked for the CIA, the NSA, they have a very particular view of Russia. I was terrified to come here uh, because I didn't expect to stay and I got trapped. But since I've been here, I've been very successful, actually, in avoiding government entanglements. Uh, I was really afraid that they were going to pressure me, they were going to follow me around. Uh, and of course, I've said before in sworn testimony that they did try in the airport. Uh, but I had a journalist with me, and I gave them the stiff arm, and I said, look, guys, I don't have any information, I don't have any documents, I'm not going to cooperate. Uh, and Surprisingly, I think due to the political uh, complexities of the situation, they had a tough choice. They went, we can either try to lean on this guy, right, or we can leave him alone and for once, maybe Russia will get some good PR out of this. Now, I think uh, the most surprising part of this is not the fact uh, that the government has left me alone for the most part. Uh, but the fact that Russia is not this disastrous and sad place. They have very troubled politics, as many countries do. Uh, and there are a lot of reforms that I feel, as an American, desperately need to be made. But it's a beautiful country. And the regular people who are going about their lives every day want the same things that we as Americans do. And it seems like that should be obvious, but for me, and I think many others, it really wasn't. A lot has changed since you've been here, and as you know, we have a new president-elect. What do you think of Donald Trump? <laughs> I try not to, um, but I think we all have to. This is, 
this really feels like a year in which everybody was wrong about everything. Um, so many people had predictions, so many people had ideas, uh, and I think most Americans, uh, whether they worked in the press, whether they were ordinary people, simply could not imagine we would be where we are today. And yet here we are. Now, the reason I say I try not to think about Donald Trump is that we shouldn't be focusing on people. We should be focusing on the directions, the impacts, the policies that this will lead to. Presidents come and go, policies stay. The executive director of Human Rights Watch, Ken Roth, uh, said just a few days ago that he thinks we're seeing the rise of a new kind of leader in different countries around the world, a more authoritarian leader who sees rights not necessarily as a good thing, but as a barrier to implementing the will of the majority. But from my perspective, and I believe this is a fundamentally American idea, this is what rights are for. Rights are the only thing that stands behind, stands between decades and centuries of democratic progress and one election that changes everything and leads to, rather than an enlightened society, a tyranny of the majority. Now that's not to say what's coming, but when we have all three branches of government suddenly captured and controlled by a single party, that is a moment of systemic risk. And we need to think about what that means could be coming, what the risks are, and what we can do as citizens, how we can be more active in ensuring the country that we've built over so many years continues to be built in the right way. I think Tomorrow is very uncertain right now, but we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should recognize that. We should prepare for that. Don't be afraid, be ready. What worries you the most about a Trump presidency? The main things that I would be concerned about uh, are policies that aren't pursuing a positive vision. They're not thinking about what America is really about, and how to improve it, but how to retaliate against a small group, a vulnerable population, a particular class. To me, these don't seem like particularly American directions to be heading. Now, this is not to say that I don't want this president or any other president uh, to be successful. Uh, in fact, I want every president to be successful in building a better America but we need to make sure that that's what's happening. And we can't trust that that will happen. We can't wait for somebody to do that. If we want to be in a better America, we have to do it ourselves. Right before the election, you tweeted, quote, there may never be a safer election in which to vote for a third option. <laughs> yeah. Any regrets about that tweet? You know, this is one of those things where I said, you know, everybody's been wrong. Uh, I was referencing the New York Times front page uh, when I made that tweet where they said Hillary Clinton had a 93% chance of winning the election. And I believed the statistics, you know, I was certain that she had this in the bag. Uh, and because of that, you know, it seemed like everything was open, the possibilities that were there. The election wasn't even really an election. I was wrong. Do I regret that? Uh, I don't think I regret trusting the statistics were right, uh, because I think particularly when we're focused on scientific methods of polling, uh, we need to be able to recognize that experts have information, they're using methods, uh, and this should be reliable. We should take this into account. Before the election, as you know, the DNC and the Clinton campaign were both hacked. U.S. intelligence officials, including the head of Homeland Security, have said they believe only Russia's senior most officials could have authorized those hacks. Do you think Russia was behind those hacks? I don't know. But as somebody who worked in intelligence, I certainly think it's possible. They definitely have the capabilities. And there is, I think, a broad consensus among U.S. intelligence uh, officials, at least as has been sort of promoted in the news, uh, that Russia did have some responsibility behind this. But what bothers me about this kind of conversation uh, 
is that the last time there was a significant hack that affected the United States that we believed had an association to a nation state, it was the Sony hack, which we said North Korea was behind. The FBI immediately released evidence that they believe proved that they were behind that attack. We haven't seen that here. And I think if we're gonna have this conversation, it should be evidence-based. Other than the fact that they've said complimentary things about each other, why do you think Vladimir Putin would want Donald Trump to be president? Or did he simply abhor the possibility of Hillary Clinton in that role? I think it came down to the idea generally, uh, right or wrong, uh, that Hillary Clinton had a very clear set of policies that uh, Russians would consider to be anti-Russian. Donald Trump's policies, no one has any idea what they are. No one has any idea what they mean. Uh, even for him himself, it seems, uh, they change quite frequently, sometimes within the space of weeks, sometimes within the space of days. And they may have preferred uncertainty to certainty. The DNC and the Clinton campaign emails were obtained by WikiLeaks. I'm just curious, how do you feel about Julian Assange and his wholesale dumping of these emails? They have a very different policy uh, than I followed uh, in my work with journalists. But they have taken a position, they sort of embody a belief, that the only way they can prove the authenticity uh, of these documents uh, is to release them in what they call a pristine, untampered condition. From my perspective, I was in a very different position because, of course, this was not an anonymous leak. I came out behind them. Uh, I said, these are from the NSA, this is who I am. And immediately we knew they were real because the government came after me with many charges and threatened to put me in prison for the rest of my life. Uh, but I felt that this was a risk worth taking for me because uh, there would be no question as to the authenticity of the documents, which gave me room to instead focus on how can this information be revealed in the most responsible way to fully mitigate any potential, actual, or theoretical risks that could come as a result of this journalism. Uh, and I'm very proud of the way that we did that. Uh, and I'm very comfortable with the decisions that we made. Let's talk about your pardon now. The Pardon Snowden campaign launched in September, led by backers like George Soros, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, the ACLU. What do you think your chances are that President Obama will in fact pardon you? Well, I'm not counting on it, and this is the, the key here. The possibility for a pardon, it seems to every expert who's looked at this issue, has never been more likely. And this is a surprise to myself more than anyone else, I think. Why do you say that? Well, just a few days ago, we had uh, 15 members of the church committee. Most people may not remember what they are, but in the 1970s, the intelligence organizations went through the greatest period of oversight of their history. They, they sort of uh, pulled up the blankets and looked at what was happening at the CIA, the NSA, the FBI. They were writing letters to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, saying that they had tapes of what he had done in hotel rooms, and if he didn't commit suicide, they were going to release them and destroy his reputation. Uh, they were secretly administering uh, psychedelic drugs to college students to see the impacts they would have. They were engaging in assassination operations that were contrary to both American and international law. All kinds of crazy things. These individuals who are experts in what's going on in intelligence at the classified level, who worked for the government, right? These aren't uh, sort of hippie reformers or anything like that. They argued that President Obama should seriously consider leniency in this case. They said uh, that this case has caused far more benefits to American society, which I think is uncontroversial at this point, uh, than any claimed harms for which we've never seen evidence. If you had one minute to make your case face to face to President Obama, what would you say to convince him to pardon you? I wouldn't. I would respectfully say to the president, uh, I understand you have an incredibly difficult job. No one wants to be a whistleblower. This is something that's hard to do. 
Uh, it's hard enough to stand up to a bully uh, in your life, uh, to your boss in the office, much less the combined might of the National Security Agency, the FBI, and you know, the apparatus of government. Nobody's going to volunteer for that. Nobody's going to uh, sort of take this as a precedent and it's going to open floodgates. But there's one thing that I would hope he understands, and I think based on his recent statements, he does. Uh, he said that my actions and this journalism raised legitimate concerns. We're living in a time today where journalism is occurring in an environment of an extraordinary threat. And as official sources of information for the American citizen, the American voter, begin to dry up, confidential sources, the sources upon which the best journalism has always relied, people in government who know the reality of what's actually going on, particularly when the operations of government start to go out of bounds, are critical now. And this is America. When something goes wrong, don't we want somebody to stand up and say something about it? Are you saying it's particularly important in a Trump administration or in a Republican-controlled Washington? I don't think it's about party. I don't think it's about person. I do think uh, the incoming president uh, has definitely said he plans to break some furniture, right? Uh, he would be the last to deny this. And that means we need to be careful. That means we need to prepare. Donald Trump tweeted about you in 2014, writing, Snowden is a traitor. When our country was great, do you know what we did to traitors? Meanwhile, his pick for CIA director, Kansas Congressman Mike Pompeo, has called you a liar and a criminal, and in at least one interview also called for your execution. What's your reaction? I wonder when it is that he thinks America was great. Because if you remember what we did to traitors in 1776 and afterwards, we made them president. We're a country that was born from an act of treason against a government that had run out of control. Now, this is not to say that breaking the rules is something that should happen all the time, but we should always make a distinction that right and wrong is a very different standard than legal and illegal. The law is no substitute for morality, here or then. Are you saying what you did was right? I think, yeah. Or I, legal, I, or I, both? I would not have done it if I didn't believe it was right. But you would acknowledge it was illegal? I definitely would say uh, it's pretty sketchy there. But look, every act of progression in our nation's history has involved tension with law. Whether it was the abolition of slavery, whether it was the enfranchisement of women, uh, whether it was the birth of our nation, laws were broken, and that's because the laws were wrong. There is a lot of talk out there, including among top-ranking intelligence officials, that Vladimir Putin may hand you over to the United States as a good well, well gesture uh, to the Trump administration. How concerned slash nervous are you about that possibility? <laughs> I'm actually kind of encouraged. Encouraged? For completely different reasons. Uh, it wasn't so many years ago that people were saying, this guy's a Russian spy. But countries don't give up their spies. And if my recent criticism of the Russian government's internet policies, uh, criticisms of their human rights records, have been so severe that even my greatest critics in the intelligence community are now saying, oh yeah, he's a liability, they want to get him out of there. That's a vindication. A vindication of what? The fact that I am independent, the fact that I have always worked on behalf of the United States, and the fact that Russia doesn't own me. In fact, the Russian government may see me as sort of a liability. So you wouldn't mind if Putin said, extradited you and said, here you go, President Trump. 
Well, who wouldn't? I mean, that would obviously be something that would bother me. That would obviously be something that would be a threat to my liberty and to my life. Uh, but what I'm saying here is that you can't have it both ways. You can't say this guy is a bad guy who's like a, a Russian tool or something like that. At the same time, you say he's going to be traded away. What I'm proud of is the fact that every decision that I made, I can defend. Another option for you is a plea deal. What can you tell us about the ongoing conversations between your legal team and the Justice Department? Well, I can't get into any confidential legal conversations. What I can say is what's been made public uh, so far, which is that I've only ever had a single condition for returning to the United States, volunteering uh, to go to court, and very likely to prison. And that's that the government guarantee a fair trial, an open trial, where they don't try to control what I can say and what the jury can hear. They've never agreed to this. And in fact, even though we've made that our grounds, They've responded with only a single promise, and that's they say, we won't torture you. You don't believe you'll be able to get a fair trial in the United States? It's not possible to get a fair trial under the laws with which I've been charged. The Espionage Act of 1917 you're referring to. That's correct. Uh, this is a law which prohibits an individual who's charged with this crime from telling the jury why it is that they did what they did. This is fundamentally against the idea of a fair trial. If you can't explain yourself to the jury, why have a trial at all? How much prison time would you be willing to serve? I don't put a number on it. Instead, I look at it from a very different perspective. We're going into a world, again, we're here now, where whistleblowers are more important than ever. What kind of a message would I be sending if in perhaps the most responsible case of modern whistleblowing uh, that we have now, uh, where no clear harm has occurred that's been demonstrated by evidence, uh, but clear public benefits have occurred. The President of the United States himself said, this conversation started by the NSA revelations, started by me, has made us stronger as a nation. Congress passed the first significant reforms to U.S. intelligence laws in more than 40 years. Uh, the courts themselves found the documents that I revealed showed unlawful and likely unconstitutional activities on the part of the government. Given all of that, given how much we've benefited, if I go to prison for the rest of my life, what's that going to do for the next person who sees something illegal, who sees something unconstitutional, and realizes they may be the only one who can do something about it? Chelsea Manning is serving 35 years in prison. Why shouldn't you? I think the right answer to look at here is, why is Chelsea Manning in prison for 35 years? Is this a just sentence? This is an individual who revealed unambiguous war crimes. There are some arguments that say she went too far. Maybe she released too much. But what we know now is that information was released in 2009. We're now in 2016. And with each passing year, it gets harder and harder to demonstrate any real harm that came as a result of these disclosures. But the benefits are clear. She's tried to take her life twice this year. Has she not suffered enough? Potentially, what would a plea deal look like for you? You know, I'm not actually sure because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but the idea here is when most people who are involved in uh, government or the intelligence community are involved in some sort of case uh, where the government goes, this person was acting in good faith, they were trying to do right by the American people, but they did break the law, no charges are ever brought, or they're brought very minimally. Perhaps the best known case in recent history here is General Petraeus, uh, who shared information that was far more highly classified than I ever did with journalists. And he shared this information not with the public for their benefit, but with his biographer and lover for personal benefit. Uh, conversations that had uh, information, detailed information, about military special access programs uh, that's classified above top secret conversations with the president and so on. When the government came after him, they charged him with a misdemeanor. He never spent a single day in jail, despite the type of classified information he exposed. 
when we had the most senior intelligence official in the United States, General James Clapper, who lied to the American people and all of Congress on camera, under oath, in the Senate, in a famous exchange with Ron Wyden. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently, perhaps, uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. He wasn't even charged. But giving false testimony to Congress under oath, as he did, is a felony. It's typically punished by three to five years in prison. Are you suggesting there's a double standard between high-ranking officials and lower-level employees such as yourself? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm suggesting it. I think everyone's aware of it. Uh, we have a two-tiered system of justice in the United States where people who are either well-connected to government or they have access to an incredible amount of resources get very light punishments. The House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence conducted an exhaustive two-year investigation into your actions. In a letter to President Obama, the committee wrote, quote, he's not a patriot, he's not a whistleblower, he's a criminal. What's your reaction to that characterization? I would say it's funny how quickly the president himself distanced himself by, from this report in his recent remarks by saying that Mr. Snowden raised legitimate concerns. Uh, but in direct response to this report, uh, I won't actually say anything. Instead, I'll use the words of three-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, one of the most respected in the United States, Barton Gelman of the Washington Post, who has seen the material that I turned over uh, and knows that in fact that was not true. He found that four out of the six claims uh, that the Intelligence uh, Committee made in this report were verifiably false. He had the evidence to show this. Uh, the fifth one was specious at best. And the sixth was what, that I faked a sick day when I was trying to get out to meet with journalists, which, let's be real, I am completely and totally guilty of. Uh, he said the report was not only inaccurate, not only incurious, but trifling. Admiral Mike Rogers, the director of the NSA, told Yahoo News this year that your disclosures accelerated a move by terrorists to encrypted communications and made it easier for them to plan attacks like the one in Paris without being detected. He said, quote, no one should doubt for one minute there has been an impact because of your disclosures. It's funny that he says that because he's also said on the record to journalists that when he looks around, the sky is not falling. The NSA's operations have not been significantly hindered, and they're still very much in business. Moreover, we know for a fact at this point that the Paris attackers were not using encrypted communications, and in fact were using simple burner phones of the type that drug dealers were using back in the 1990s. Even if there is not any specific concrete evidence that your actions aided terrorists, there's also no specific concrete evidence that they didn't. And even Barton Gelman, the reporter you just mentioned, one of the journalists with whom you share classified documents said, quote, I do not share the view of some of his fans that he did no damage at all. Can you at least acknowledge that damage might have been done as a result of your disclosures? I don't agree with him in that regard. What I will say is this. Whenever we're talking about damage without evidence, uh, this is an intentional effort to change the conversation from the concrete harms of these programs that violated the rights of every man, woman, and child in the United States and people around the world and instead talk about the theoretical risks of journalism. Uh, what Barton Gelman was acknowledging there was that yes, it's possible that officials could have been embarrassed by this. Reputations could have been damaged by this. And the intelligence community considers this to be a matter of national security. But I would argue there's more than to national security than reputation. But aren't we talking in fairness more than simply reputations or being embarrassed. Virtually every U.S. security official, current and former, agrees that these disclosures made it more difficult to track the movements of organizations like ISIS and other terrorist groups. 
I don't agree with that. Now, of course, it's reasonable to presume that these things could happen. Terrorists read the newspaper, too. But I'll tell you, terrorists already knew the NSA was coming after them. And what we saw in the newspaper wasn't anything that they didn't already understand. What was revealed in the newspaper was only a surprise to Americans and ordinary citizens. How many documents were provided to journalists? <laughs> this is a good question, but I have to say, remember, I am still under active investigation, so I can't answer FBI-style questions on camera. Because the number has ranged from 50,000 to, as you said, 1.5 million. You can't give us any idea? What I can tell you is the journalists, uh, and there are several of them, have consistently said the government's numbers are ludicrous overestimates. You also revealed to a reporter at the South China Morning Post that the U.S. was conducting surveillance of people and organizations in China. Why did you do that, and wasn't that a violation of U.S. security and national interest? I don't think so at all. Uh, the type of uh, surveillance that we were talking about was not of the Chinese government. It was not about the Chinese military. It was not about any valid intelligence targets. This was about civilian infrastructure, hospitals, universities that had been digitally hacked and compromised by the United States that caused a real threat to life. Now, it's not to say the U.S. shouldn't engage in any hacking, but when we start hacking hospitals, this is something that we, as a public, need to decide if it's a step too far. You're not anti-surveillance writ large, are you? Absolutely not. If it's specifically targeted, if it's authorized by the court, based on a showing of probable cause that the court, the judge, says, look, we think this person's up to no good. You've shown evidence that they're up to no good. Go after them. That's how it should be done. I asked about that interview because there's speculation there was some kind of quid pro quo with China. You give us information, you can come to Hong Kong. Well, let's be clear here. I never provided any information to China. The journalist in question was an Australian. Working for the South China Morning Post. They're a freelancer, but yes. So, working for a publication in China. Oh, I knew them as an Australian journalist. I didn't know their outlet. So you didn't even know that it was going to be in a newspaper in China? I knew it would be in a newspaper. I didn't know what newspaper. This was not my concern. What about this notion of a quid pro quo, that people think there was some kind of under-the-table deal? Well, it's clear that's not the case, because if it had, I would have stayed in Hong Kong. You arrived in Hong Kong on May 10th, 2013, met with journalists Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras on June 1st. There have been some questions about where you were and what you were doing during those 10 days before you met with those journalists. I was in the Mirror Hotel waiting for those journalists. Uh, what people sort of miss in this conspiracy theory, it's only held by a few people, uh, is that the journalists weren't able to immediately travel. They had to talk to their newspapers, get permission, they had to get legal backing, they had to get funding, and get their institutions on board to actually travel to Hong Kong. What were you doing during those 10 days then? Waiting for them to come. I was in the hotel room the whole time. In Citizen Four, the tension of those moments in Hong Kong is palpable. You're seen going through a series of security rituals, unplugging phones, covering your head as you type passwords into your computer. You seem keenly aware of a target being on your back. Could you describe those days for us before you went public, what that was like? You know, it's those moments, it's, in, it's, it's actually difficult to watch them on film because the pressure, the stress was so great that I was almost in a, like a fueg state. Uh, you've, you lose your emotional affect. Uh, you can't be as, as high or as low as you normally are. You're only focused on one thing, and that's the mission. Before you left Hong Kong, I know you reportedly went to the Russian embassy. Can you tell me why and what you did there? No, there's a crazy conspiracy theory out there that I was a Chinese spy when I was in China. I'm a Russian spy when I'm in Russia. They say, you know, I'm partying in the Russian embassy, having birthday parties. It's completely wrong. And this is the reason why that wasn't a newspaper report that was carried around the world. Somebody raised this as a conspiracy theory and nobody could confirm it because it didn't happen. After you were granted 
asylum in Russia in August of 2013. You issued a statement through WikiLeaks criticizing the Obama administration for showing no respect for international and domestic law and thanking Russia. Do you believe Russia has more respect for international law than the United States? No, and I think this is kind of a false choice here. You're saying, who's worse? Who do you want to beat up on? Are you going to condemn the United States? No. The United States does wonderful things for human rights in many areas around the world, but we have to remember that nobody's perfect. Russia has a very poor human rights record in many areas, but when they can do something good, when they can actually stand up for the rights of a dissident, shouldn't we applaud them? It's very easy nowadays for a Chinese dissident or a Russian dissident to get asylum anywhere in the world, right? Uh, you know, doors are open everywhere. But I applied for asylum in 21 different countries around the world, all throughout Western Europe, countries like France, like Germany, like Norway, like Sweden. And every time they got close to saying, yes, let's grant this man asylum, phones would ring in the government from the Vice President of the United States, from the Secretary of State, saying, if you protect this man, regardless of whether it's right or wrong, regardless of whether it's lawful or unlawful, we will take some retaliatory action. Should we applaud that? That doesn't mean the United States is some human rights monster, but we should recognize on a case-by-case -case basis that sometimes we can do right and can sometimes you, we can do wrong. Can you see the irony in you, the poster child for civil liberties and privacy, finding sanctuary in a place that has little respect for either? Absolutely, but let's uh, again look at this. I have been a tireless advocate uh, for the expansion of Russian internet freedom since I've been in Russia. Russia recently passed uh, what's called the Yaravaya Law. Uh, colloquially, it's called the Big Brother Law. Uh, that's an internet surveillance law. I said on passage, it was a dark day for all Russians. It was taking money from the average Russian citizen. It was narrowing the scope of their rights. This is a wound on Russian society. And believe me, that's unlikely to win me any friends in Russian government. But it's something that needs to be said. I know that you have said you did not provide any documents or share any intelligence with the Russian government. But I want to ask you about something that was published last June, where a member of Russia's parliament publicly conceded that you did, in fact, share intelligence with the Russian government. What did you make of that? I'm really glad you asked that, uh, because this is a broadly misreported point. Uh, this individual didn't actually say that. It's a mistranslation based on an NPR report, where this individual in Russian said, let's be frank, I think they were speculating that Russia's services would of course approach me and that I would share information with them. It didn't happen. I've never shared information with Russia's intelligence services. Let me ask you about Vladimir Putin. Have you ever met him? <laughs> I have not met Vladimir Putin. This is kind of a surprising thing. I mean, in the United States, the number of people who meet the president is pretty limited. He's a busy guy. He's got a lot going on. But people seem to think that I'm going ice skating with Vladimir Putin in Red Square, you know, every weekend. We're riding polar bears over the tundra. Yeah, no, I've never met the Russian president. I have no intention to. Do you have to be careful what you say about him, giving, given that this country has provided you sanctuary? I don't know if I am supposed to. I haven't done a very good job. You have been critical of him, haven't you? I have. And you feel comfortable doing so? This... You know, some people live very careful lives. I haven't done a very good job at that. If safety was my number one priority, I never would have left Hawaii. I would still be working at the NSA, making an extraordinary amount of money for very little work, violating Americans' rights. No one would know what was going on today. And yes, you know, I'm never going to leave, live a completely stable life. Even if I'm pardoned, even if I return to the United States, there are a lot of people who will disagree with the decisions that I made, but I'm comfortable with them. I realize that the laws of the United States have been changed for the better as a result. The President of the United States, for the first time in our history, has provided privacy protections to people who aren't American citizens as a result. Uh, 
the courts and Congress are finally at least starting to play the role that they were intended to play, no matter the cost, I can be happy with that. You have said that you raise concerns about excessive NSA surveillance with 10 superiors and colleagues, but only one email has been made public, one to a lawyer at the NSA with a legal inquiry critics say had nothing to do with releasing these documents. If you attempted to go through the proper channels, Ed, or at least reached out to colleagues, why didn't share, you, you save those communications um, as evidence? Well, this is a really good question, right? Because it's one of those that seems like, you know, why doesn't he have this? First off, I'm not an email administrator, so I didn't have access to everybody's email. But these aren't things you put in writing at NSA. Saying, I think the NSA is breaking the law, I think maybe this program is violating the Constitution, is a career-ending move. Uh, and the people that I talked to first, my supervisor said, you know, hey, we can talk about this, but you shouldn't rock the boat and don't write this down. Why haven't you given any names to corroborate the fact that you did, in fact, try to go through the so-called proper channels? Because if I did that, they would end the careers of these individuals, right? Uh, if these individuals spoke on their own without waiting for me, they would go to jail. But there's a broader point here. And this is the idea that proper channels work, that they exist, that they are available. The whistleblower process is fundamentally broken in the intelligence community. It can be said that there is no such thing at all. The proper channels are really a drain into which people, concerns, and cares are flushed. In 2014, Glenn Greenwald, one of the journalists with whom you worked, said, quote, the most shocking and significant stories have yet to be reported. Are there still bombshells in this cache of documents that has, have still not seen the light of day? Well, I was very careful when I came forward again uh, to make sure that I never revealed a single secret. Uh, this, I believe quite strongly, is the role of free press in our society. This is why the First Amendment is first. They're charged with making these decisions about what we should know, when, and how. They should contest the government's monopoly on controlling information, particularly in the classified spaces. Uh, so I'm not going to say uh, if there's something else coming or when, uh, but I will say this. In 2013, before this started, the idea that the government was collecting records of every phone call in the United States was a conspiracy theory. It's not anymore. Some Americans might say, hey, we appreciate your shedding light on this, but for us, security and thwarting a terrorist attack is more important than privacy. This is, you know, a, a very common sort of throwaway argument from people who are just trying to avoid talking about uh, the topic too much. They say, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. You know, why do you care? They don't think about the origin of that quote, which is literally a piece of Nazi propaganda from Joseph Goebbels. This is not to say the NSA are Nazis. They're not the Stasi. These are good people doing bad things for what they believe are good reasons. Privacy is the foundation of all other rights. I would say arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. What is the best thing in your view that came from these revelations? Before 2013, I think Americans all felt something was changing, but they couldn't quite put their finger on it when it came to policy, particularly uh, this idea of counterterrorism. We heard terrorism, terrorism, we're trying to keep you safe over and over again. But it seemed that these programs weren't actually keeping us safe. We didn't know it at the time, but the NSA was tapping every phone in the United States, and yet it didn't stop the Boston Marathon bombings. We were collecting all of the internet communications as they crossed the border and saw if something was going on, but these were not the things that thwarted terrorist attacks. The things that were effective, the things that worked, were the methods that we always used. Traditional, good old-fashioned police work. The cop on the street who saw someone acting suspiciously. Human intelligence. Exactly. Our founding fathers said, 
He who would sacrifice essential liberty for a little temporary safety deserves neither and won't get them either. This is very much what we are waking up to. The idea that in many ways the public has lost their seat at the table of government as an equal partner. I know your residency permit runs out, Ed, in 2017. If it's renewed, are you prepared to live in Russia for the rest of your life? And what are your other options if it's not renewed? This is actually not my first foreign posting on behalf of the United States. Uh, when I worked for the CIA, I was in Switzerland. When I worked for the NSA, I was in Japan. The way I look at it, this is just more of the same. It's a very different situation, and I didn't choose this particular posting. Uh, but look, if this is the best way I can serve my country, I'm looking forward to doing it. Lindsay Mills, your girlfriend, moved here in 2014. Um, how is she adjusting to her life here in Russia? You know, it's surprising how adaptable people are. It's not easy living in exile for anyone. Uh, you know, it's not the place where you belong. It's not a language that you studied in advance. Uh, it's tough to figure out how to make a new life. But she is an incredible person because I signed up for this. I knew what was coming. I was volunteering for these risks. I couldn't tell her in advance, because if I did, the FBI would treat her as an accomplice. Uh, they would try to put her in prison instead of me. You basically said, I'm not going to be home when you get back. Yes. And I mean, <laughs> imagine that. Uh, it probably makes me the world's worst boyfriend. But she didn't hate me for it. In fact, she seemed to love me more, because she She knew me before I had a job. Uh, she knew me before uh, I was making good money. Uh, and she cared about me then. And as I climbed the ladder, as I gained all these clearances, as I became a much more senior and successful individual, uh, she cared about me uh, just as much. But when I lost it all, when I gave it all up, because I saw something wrong, something I believed needed to be said. She said she just fell in love with me all over again. And I can never thank her enough for that. What do you miss most about the United States? Family, of course. That's always the thing. You know, they can come and see me, but you've got all these travel arrangements and logistics. You've got to go on an airplane ride. Uh, who doesn't miss that? When you look back at the last three years, was it worth it? Absolutely. I would do it again. No regrets? No regrets at all. People listening to this might think, are you kidding? No <laughs> regrets? Well, I do have to deal with some tough interviews now. But uh, <laughs> honestly, I'm glad we can have these conversations. And I hope that we work to make an America that never loses the opportunity to do this. Look, journalism is a hard job. I understand that. Uh, and I think it's clearer now than perhaps ever before that if we don't make sure that sources and journalists can have these conversations, and not outside borders where you've got to fly around the world to have it, but at home, before we get to this point where it's such a problem, we're losing a lot of what makes us great. Do you think you'll ever be able to convince Ed, people who have very little sympathy for you who don't believe you should be walking around a free man here in Moscow, but instead you should be in prison. Can, what do you say to those people who just do not understand your point of view? I'm not going to ask them to trust me. I'm not going to ask them to believe in me, because I think Americans have had enough of people saying, trust us. That was the problem that got us here in the first place. But what I will say is this. In 2013, it was pretty easy to say, we don't know what's coming. This guy probably took a lot of risks. This is really irresponsible. This is going to cause harm. But in 2016, these officials have had every opportunity to show evidence that harm came as a result. 
and they haven't. Do you really think if the government can show somebody was hurt, a program was damaged, we've gone dark and can't track dangerous people, they wouldn't leak that criticism. That wouldn't be on the front page of the New York Times by the end of the day. I don't think so. And I hope maybe in time you'll think the same. Ed Snowden, thank you so much for spending all this time talking to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much.